Okay, so in this workshop, I'm going to start with some definitions, and definitions will help uh, kind of frame the conversation. Uh, if by any chance you are triggered by any of the conversation that we're having today, I do have an ally here that is trained in helping you. So if you want to have a conversation, Loey, if you want to raise your hand, uh, Loey is available to you for a resource. Um, if you want to uh, use her, feel free to give her a talk. Um, so after these definitions, we'll go ahead and talk about why d &I is important in Web3, and then we'll go on to a couple of different activities. Okay. So uh, for definitions, the first definition that we want to kind of think about is what is called privilege. And privilege is understanding like a difference within power and understanding that there are some, there are some ways where you naturally have power or privilege in a situation where another group will, be, will not have power. And usually the group that has the power is the privileged group, and the, power, the group that does not have the power is called the oppressed group. Um, these forces and powers can be racially divided, it can be general, uh, gender divided. Uh, here at DevCon, the privileged groups are, can you think of a group, privileged group to here at DevCon? White men, that might work. Okay, what else would be a privileged group here at DevCon? Uh, cis guys, okay, VCs, okay, rich people, okay, what else would be a privilege? Good passports, that would be one. What else would be a privilege? How about speaking English first? Language is a privilege, right? So you have all of this, uh, how about uh, physical abilities, going up and down the stairs, like there are a lot of different ways. Uh, if you're someone who might be like neuroatypical, this is a very overstimulating place, uh, you might have privilege on that aspect. So there's a lot of aspects of privilege that are in play all the time around us. Um, and so that's something that we might just want to be aware of is where your privilege is coming through. After privilege, we have bias. Does anyone know what bias is? Biases are like the way that are kind of almost unconscious privileges kind of show up per se. So one of the things that I would definitely encourage you to do is there is a Harvard implicit bias test. And like one of the ways it shows up within our workplace is like holidays, right? So everyone knows we get Christmas and New Year's off, which is great, but it's also religious bias because it's not just Christians that still have celebrations throughout the year. Um, so you can take the Harvard implicit bias test to just kind of know where your biases are showing up. And it's important to know where your biases show up so that when you create policies or procedures, you're just aware of where your biases are. You try to like not, if you're aware of your biases, you're trying to not intentionally do harm. And like being aware of your biases are those steps. Does anyone know where biases show up within the workplaces? <laughs> it shows up a lot. But one of the biases that shows up a lot within Web 2 and Web 3 is uh, college degrees or uh, undergrad backgrounds. That kind of also will have biases as well. That's a bias for sure. Anyone else? Okay, so when we talk about biases and privileges, we start to realize that there is that definition between the power struggles that happen, and that if you want to try to leverage and make it like level for everybody, then you need to have an ally. And an ally is someone who recognizes like, hey, there is a power indifference, and I'm going to fight, and I, and I want for that power to be removed so that you have a just world just as much as I do. So that is what's called an ally, and sometimes you'll hear, like, if you're around me, I'll say, like, oh, I need an ally, which means, like, I need someone who is not like me, who has that power, to use their power in a way that benefits the situation and leverages the injustice of power that I would have, or the other person who without power has. But a step beyond allies is actually a called accomplice, and that's what I would really want y'all to be. An accomplice is someone who, like, says yes, you do have a power and difference, and I'm going to level it and use all my power to level it as much as but I'm going to be in the trenches with you as we move this forward. And so there's one aspect where you're recognizing like, oh, there is a power and difference and it's not really fair, and I hope that works out for you. And then there's a difference with, hey, there is a power and difference, that's not really fair, I'm gonna do everything I can to justify that power and difference, and that's where I hope we all become in this space. So why is it important to, in Web3? 
these are like generally like over the top issues that we kind of think about. One of the things is like 30, racially diverse teams perform 35% better than non-racially diverse teams. So if you want to like easily have a better performing team, have diversity on your team. That's like one of the easiest way to do it. Again, teams where women and men earn equally will actually have 40%, 41% higher revenue generated for the organization. So if your org wants to easily have make more money, have equally diverse teams from a gender perspective, um, you know, have a uh, don't have a gender pay gap would be uh, another way to do it. But the key reasons that these are important to Web3 are the actual like ethos of Web3. So when you think of like decentralization, you think of identity, you think of plurality, all of the time we talk about this uh, from a technical perspective, but this is also like a human perspective. So when you think of decentralization, like we always talk about nodes, having all these nodes decentralized, but if we're starting to create like systems and procedures, you really want to have decentralization of thought as well. And so sometimes when we start to like think of decentralization of thought or how our people we centralize, we kind of centralize as well, here, in your mind, I want you to think of the, like an event, right? And you're going to take five people to that event. Your, your best five people, right? Close your eyes, think about it. Who are the five people you're going to take mentally? To think about them. Okay. What are their ages? Where do they live? Where do they go to school? What gender are they? Are you yourself centralizing around any one of those, or do you have a diverse group around you making that decision? So as you make a decision, are you decentralizing itself and making a decision that has a voice of a lot of people? Are you making an assumption for people that are centralized along one of those verticals? Decentralization helps you have a lot of people thinking about the best way to attack a problem and the best way to move forward. So the more that we can say, like, is this decentralized as far as we're making, like, people processes or if we're, is this decentralized from a Web3 perspective, you also want different types of people building different types of things from different types of perspectives, and that helps be a stronger network, you know? Um, that, to me, also reminds me of plurality, where we say, like, hey, it's not trying to have one team make it. It's, like, it's we all get stronger when everyone gets stronger. And that ethos applies towards... Uh, different types of peoples as well. So when you start to understand different Web3 ethos, you can apply them to technology, you can apply them to software, but you can also apply them to peoples and people's needs. So even if it's difficult for you to understand, like, you know, I, won't, I don't understand, you know, an Asian male's perspective, but I can fight for them because I believe in plurality. That might be a way to, like, fight for the underdog, per se. So we think about this, I also think about this as being extremely important from an identity perspective in Web3, because in Web3, uh, a lot of us are known through like our ENS domains or like our Lens Protocol domains or whatever you're using and our NFTs. So you could be interacting with a person's image in an ETH domain and not really know the person behind it, per se. And so you kind of just have to be uh, realizing that that person might be going through a lot of different things, but you don't even know what that person is going through. So the more that you can advocate holistically across the board for all different types of people, the better um, it can be. And when you start to like me minimalize groups or think like, oh, there's not someone with an, um, an LGBT background within our group, that so we don't have to worry about it. That might not, may or may not be true because you don't know someone beyond again a, an NS, a NFT in an ETH domain. So uh, the more that we can create better policies for everyone, the better off we can be, or at least be accomplices to people, the better off we will be. Okay, cool. So here's the meat and potatoes of it. We're going to talk about how can you be a hero. And for me, a hero is anybody who can like also be an accomplice. Um, I thought I would be like really cutesy and get like a little superhero costume, and then I forgot this was around Halloween, and we were also out. So. We're going to just be our own heroes, and that will be fine today. 
Okay, so there's this concept of holding space. And a holding space can be having a meeting group to hold space. Uh, it can be holding an opportunity for certain groups to learn together. Uh, holding space can be uh, changing um, the panels on the boards or holding space on a board or a panel for someone that has is coming from that um, oppressed group and holding space for them. But it can also be opportunities like to hold space for a cohort to learn a technology. Um, it can be being intentional about like your public facing things, um, having specific cohorts for learning. So instead of having uh, everybody thinking that everybody like enters the room the same way, having specific targeted spaces for marginalized communities to learn that technology. So if you're going to, I'm going to use Chifai because Chifai is here. And let's say um, you wanted to like have a workshop that was open to like building on Lens Protocol, it would be just specifically for the Shifi community to learn and realizing that that community learns in a different way than you know the general population would be learning and creating a safe space for them. So uh, holding safe space is extremely important when you're dealing with marginalized groups because um, the, it recognizes that just by stepping in the room, there are power dynamics that are in play. All right, environmental safety. This one is a huge one this week for me uh, here. So one of the things that we have talked about in the past is like the importance of having a code of conduct and having procedures that actually follow those code of conducts. Um, the reason why code of conducts are important is because as people, again, we have biases and the code of conduct is supposed to be the you know, the guidance and policies and procedures that are put in place to mitigate those biases or to be in place um, regardless of the biases. So it's the steps that we take in order for things to happen. Um, those steps mean nothing if we don't take them. So having the code of conduct or seeing that there is a code of conduct is helpful, but you need to also be enforcing code of conducts too. Um, being aware of microtrends, microaggressions. Does anyone know what a microaggression is? Would it be helpful for me to explain it? Yes? Lori, you want to explain it? Cool. Yeah. Micro, go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Uh, okay, a microaggression is like uh, something that is like a small act that adds up to a feeling of oppression over time. Like, uh, like, the fact, like for me as a woman, um, like someone might at work compliment me on my, on my outfit or on my appearance. And like that happens to women a lot, even though it's like nice to say like, hey, you look good today. But the fact that like as a woman, that's what people always think of you. That's like a microaggression. It might seem nice, but in the grander perspective of things, it's like adding to the fact that you're seen as like a one dimensional uh, identity. Yeah. OK, cool. Uh, yes. Yeah. Can you give me an example that, of what you would think? Uh, like, for example, when you are trying to tell someone something that is, you are, it's supposed to be looking like it's something not good, like the example that uh, she did, but instead, like, uh, oh, sorry, it's like um, you are being, you are telling a person something that is good for them, but you are not doing in a uh, happy way. Yeah. Uh, you are being aggressive, but you are saying something that is good for yeah, so I think, so I can only speak, yes, I think like, so I can think of some of the microaggressions that I get, and I think for someone, for me, I get like, you speak so well, which like seems like a compliment, but really, when you flip it around, it's actually a microaggression, because there's an assumption that I wouldn't speak well, you know, that there's a certain group of people that shouldn't speak well, or that vernacular of being well-spoken only resolves it, or that even being well-spoken is like, says something about someone where being, not being well-spoken doesn't, and it's not really that same. So just being aware of the different power dynamics is really helpful there. But yeah, there's a lot of different microaggressions. The main thing that if I could like give you a takeaway from environmental safety is when something is unsafe for someone, A, you believe them that it's unsafe, and B, you speak up. Especially if you're in the group that has the most power, speaking up is the most important thing that you can do at that moment. So. Okay, so another step for being a hero is to remove, uh, reflect, and retain. And these are like removing unnecessarily uh, biased language from job descriptions. It helps, this is a big thing in Web 2 and Web 3. Um, removed based biased requirements for jobs, such as grade level, uh, 
backgrounds, um, different types of location preferences can also be like that, or any type of vague requirements. So uh, one of the ways that that had came up before was like, we used to have a hiring bar for engineers and it'd be like, oh, this person types slow, and so they shouldn't like, get be onboarded, but then we had someone else that typed slow and was onboarded, so we were like, well, what is type slow? Like, what, what does that mean, and how, why does it even matter when you're trying to interview for engineering? And so you had to be very defined with what are your actual requirements uh, for the roles. So this is, uh, do you see anything here that would be considered uh, exclusive? Or maybe an unnecessary barrier? And I'll, I'll say background. Again, this is for like a software engineering role. But does anyone want to share what they see would be an unnecessary barrier? Degree. Sure. I'm sorry, what? Degree. Degree? Degree in those backgrounds? OK. Um, interesting project. It's quite subjective, so they can choose whatever they want. They have checked the criteria. All right. Exactly. Anything else? Strong track record. It seems you have some kind of continuity in your life that all right. Adaptability, I, I don't like on the standpoint that you can get salary to work that you are not, at least not your preferred line of work, it's not the one that you actually find out for you with that company and it's not your path where you pass plan. Yeah. Uh, yep. Let's see if there's anything else there. I also think like building the right tools for the system. I'm like, well, what's the right tools? That seems very subjective as well. Okay. So this is a little bit uh, more of an inclusive statement. Or they're trying to be a little bit more uh, inclusive. Is there any type of inclusive statement there that stands out to you? Yep. Well, I can compare to the other one uh, if this is the job requirement section. The header was what excites us versus you have. It's more direct. It's more clear. So that's what I see off that. Awesome. Anyone else? Yeah? It's more about like your, your enthusiasm, the mission, who you are, what you believe in, rather than the things you've actually had the privilege of working on in the past. Yeah. So, like, and the other one there was, we mentioned in here is strong experience and all the privilege of software. All right. This one's like your qualities, not your qualifications. And like, even though the last one, like those qualifications are pr probably trying to just be a signal of the same qualities. Like, oh, you've worked on lots of interesting projects and like internships and whatnot. Well, not everybody has that privilege, but like they could still arrive to the same like excitement, experience, strong skills. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah. It's more specific, like developing Okay. I'd say this job description is more inclusive because it encourages like a grander range of people to apply, whereas the other one like was more specific in ways that might be discouraging and just in maybe uh, encourage exclusivity, which is just maybe not what we space. Yeah. I also think that like um, if I were to read both of those examples, even if I wasn't a fit for either of them, the brand like attribution of like me being positively like aligned to this brand versus the other one. I would leave with a better uh, sense of wanting to work with you know this organization versus the previous one uh, for future time goals. Nice. All right, uh, uh, there was a mention about requirements and the list of requirements, and I just wanted to like highlight one thing when it comes to requirements and how uh, it's perceived by different types of gender specifically here. Uh, when it comes to men, men will see the list of requirements and meet 30% of them and apply for the job, and women will see the list of requirements and apply for the job after they've met 70% of the requirements. So there is a section of like self-weeding out that's happening when it comes to requirements if you're just listing requirements and not being inclusive right from the get-go. So if you're thinking about like why don't we have more women like in our org, you might want to start by looking at like how are you listing what, what you want um, to come into the org itself.
I feel like this is probably my favorite job posting um, because there's always those times when we've seen like companies that were like, yes, I want to work there. I could bring this. We could do this. But it doesn't fit into what they have listed into, their, into a job requirement. And this is kind of like an open door of like, well, you tell us what you can bring to the table, what you see missing in our org, and how you are a good fit. And I think that that happens to be a lot of a thing that will open uh, up some doors. OK, now we get to reflect. And reflect sometimes comes in um, reporting. It can come in roles. It can become responsibilities and transparency. So this actually was a Web3 statement that came out. And it was like super applauded, which is cool. And it's like, yay, they're building more uh, fi inclusive financial systems. And uh, they're happy to report that there's 50% more or 50-50 parity uh, at the location. But I just didn't want, I didn't know if any of y'all saw any problems with this. OK, that's good. Yes? Hold on a minute. Yeah, right? You see. Yep. Anyone else? Also, just what is that graph? <laughs> Thank you. I was like, there's no legend. There's no, like, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was really all of it. And I honestly am like, um, I don't think anyone's doing great. So I don't, I'm like really not keen to give anyone a pat on the back. But I really don't like people giving themselves a pat on the back. So I think the. The sense is like we can always go better. Um, also, by saying like, yeah, we're at 50 50 uh, parity with women to men, it really doesn't show like racial breakdown within the women. So it, there still could be a lot of power uh, dynamics that are at play there too. Um, so I had a lot of issues with this one specifically, but I had done reporting uh, back when I was at Square back in the day. And so I'll share a little bit of our pitfalls that we had too. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of reporting, oddly enough, um, because I feel like it makes people, it reduces people back down to numbers, and it doesn't really give us a whole uh, perspective of the health of the organization itself. Um, it also was really difficult when we followed the actual like guide on how to report your numbers. It didn't deal with any type of inter intersectionality. So if you were dealing with like racial reporting, like you had to choose. If you're a mixed person, you had to choose one side. Like you had to choose one side of your identity, and I just it wasn't very truly reflective. Um, it's not super inclusive, and it puts a lot of focus on like um, diversity, but it doesn't put a lot of focus on belonging or any type of things of that nature too. And it only focuses on numbers and matrices, which is like the worst thing that you can do. This, it's not really reflective. So other than that, we tried to do like DNI OKRs or priorities and try to look at that from a holistic level of how can we kind of uh, embrace it from a, an OKR level and what are going to be our priorities for that year. And if you can do it that way, you can keep the focus on removing barriers. And that is like what you're tied to. OK. Oddly enough, I think this is the most important piece of uh, D and I. We always talk about recruitment, 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 but a lot of discussions never talked about why certain groups are leaving, and that is usually the bigger question. So, yes, you can attract as many different types of people to your org, but if they're leaving right away or not having a great time, I think it's more important for you to figure out why that is, and what it might be like a toxic place to work or a, a place where you could uh, make it people more comfortable. So, in the Web three space, I think like we do a great, um, not even great, we do a job of <laughs> attracting people. To, there are orgs that do a great job of attracting people too, um, but it's on to us to also figure out how we retain them and empower them in the space to do the work that they want to do. Uh, so retention can be uh, double checking sa salary levels, it can be uh, transparency with salary compensation, it can be looking at different policies and seeing if their policies actually uh, empower different community groups. Um, if you have maternity leave and don't have paternity leave, that could be a problem. It can just look at looking at a lot of the uh, policies you have in place. If you have questions about policy, actually Loie is really good. She was on our people team at GetCoin and um, she was really good at trying to kind of go through a phone fine tooth comb with our policies and seeing if it's as inclusive as it could be. 
Okay, so now that we got through the R and heroes, we're gonna go with O. And thinking O is thinking outside of the box. Uh, a lot of times within Web3 or within Web2, even we talk about like, oh, there's no X, Y, and Z type of people in the org, it's because we can't find them. And then you're only looking within your own network and you're not going outside of the box. Uh, go outside the box, think of new solutions, ask different types of people, um, recruit from non-traditional places, non-traditional schools, uh, whatever was not working for you before was not obviously working, so try something new, it's always fine. Um, find the people where they are, there's lots of orgs that have, you know, women engineers, women in crypto, women in STEM, black in STEM, black in crypto, like there are all these different orgs out there that are uh, different groups marginalized or, or empowered in, and you can go engage with those groups, fund those groups, and work with those groups in order to not only, again, attract, but also see, like, how can we retain the ones that we have here? Um, engaging with partnerships there would be really, really great. Um, I know Maggie's in the room, and I know that there are other people in the room that are also leaders with a different DNI groups. Um, so hearing their perspectives and engaging in them in a way that's not like, how can we just source talent, but also how can we, like, how can we get the knowledge that you have and, and shared with us, but also how can we fund the mission that you're doing is also extremely important. So uh, I will give you an opportunity to put your money where your mouth is, and that is in GetCoin's d &I rounds. Uh, this is a very easy way for you to fund different groups that are um, in this d &I space within Web3. Um, there's two ways you can do it. One is to encourage them to apply to be a grantee in this space, and then the other way is to fund them. Um, this, uh, if you don't realize that a lot of the people who do in the work this, in this space, especially that are doing DEI work, uh, the money for the work that they do comes out of their own pocketbooks. And it is not, it's like another layer of oppression to tell the group that is being oppressed to fix their own problems with themselves rather than having the people who have the power fund the groups that are oppressed. You know? So if we can start to fund those groups, uh, it's gonna be much more impactful in the space and funding in a way that's like not conditional. So like, not in the way that like, I have $100,000, I want you to go to this school and get all the women that are in that school, but saying, hey, what do you need and how can I write the check to best amplify your work? That's the more important thing. You have to believe that the people who are doing the work know the work that they need to do and the most biggest barrier that they have to that is really just the financial barrier that's been placed, usually not on them. Um, if you're asking a group of like male VCs and having them like wanting to fund women's work and then I have to explain to you why it's important for women to be doing this stuff, then you're like, I don't get it. It's probably not me explaining it to you. You might just not get it from your perspective. So it's much more important to say, hey, what can I do to invest in y'all to do the work and then appreciate it. Ah, other things you need to do. Uh, if you're in a place where you can hire a DEI team or role, do that. Uh, you probably need it now and don't really even know it, but there, have a champion team, have a person dealing with it. Um, right now, with as much money that we're flaunting around doing, you know, swag and everything else, you could probably like fund one person on your team to actually take this on and empower them to make the changes that they need to make. Okay, so I will give you an opportunity. These are the ones that I know that you can actually fund with, but I also know it is not an inclusive list. So if you know one that I should know, uh, you can do one of two things. You can A, tweet at me and say, hey, Gloria, you should know this group. And then I will continue to build up the list. Uh, another thing is when we start to break out into teams, I would love a team that would just take on the challenge of saying, hey, let's create a doc that has as many of these DNI in Web3 lists that we can, and then we'll just share the doc after the session, and it will be one of the takeaways from the session too. Um, so yeah, whatever ones that you know, like please feel free to amplify them. You can amplify them themselves, so you can do it that way too. Um, the S in arrows in heroes is for shout out, it's, in, it's for support. Uh, the other way that you can shout out and actually kind of uh, transist this whole power dynamic is also to amplify someone who is not like you, who does your work, doing the work that, they, that you do. Um, because a lot of times the people who are in the oppressed group, their work does not go noticed. So uh, whatever you can do to amplify the work of the oppressed group um, is absolutely amazing too. So if there are like people who are, let's say, uh, working in layer ones. Let's just say, no, hold on, wait. 
people who work, yeah, let's just say layer ones. And there are like great women in layer ones that we should be following that have actual technical skills or that people should know about. Let's just create a list of the 50 women working on layer ones that you should know about. There's no reason we can't get all their Twitter names and send that out by the end of the conference today too. Like there's women doing work that should be amplified, but their voices aren't heard or they're drowned out because they're not in the, the powered group. Um, so that's one of the other teams if you want to work on that. And the second one I let you break up, we can do that too. All right, so usually I say do the work. Do the work is the most important thing in this time. Do the work for these oppressed groups and not expect the oppressed group to do the work for you. And so during the remaining time that we have in this workshop, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do the work. The do the work is going to come in multiple different ways. If you want to do the work solely, you can take the privilege test. The privilege test is a BuzzFeed test on privilege. It kind of is great to see like where you have privilege, the different types of privileges, things of that nature. Um, then there's the Harvard implicit bias test. You can do that work as well. Uh, then the other thing that you can do is to double check your code of conduct at your work and see if there's actual procedures that are in place in order to uh, move forward. Um, you can look at your diverse roles, roles and mods and see if there is diversity in your mods and your stewards um, in your board and recommend someone. Um, the other one you can do is donate to a grant round. We talked about Twitter amplification, but uh, the biggest thing that I would ask today, like if I could have us work on anything, is there has been an issue for a group that's in, been oppressed and feeling very unsafe here at DevCon. And I would really like a group of us to think of a way that we can keep people safe here for the remaining of the two days um, and what that would look like. So if you want to try to uh, think out ways that we can keep people safe for the remaining of the time at DevCon while we're here, uh, there will be a group that will go ahead and brainstorm that. Um, I don't mind if it's like hacker style or unconference style where we either have to like get a list or have a the board or have some type of way to like report when people feel unsafe and have a, the actual follow through. But if that's something you want to tackle, we can tackle that. So um, other than that too, if you all think of anything else that you want to tackle, that's fine. Uh, unconference style means that there's whiteboards and there's pens and there's post-it notes. And if you want to like create a list of the 50 black people in Web3 that you should follow, you can do that. If you want to do any type of things, um, if you have an idea, you, I'm more than happy to hand over the mic. You can pitch your idea and people can start working together on that. Yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah. You want to just go ahead and stand up and pitch it? Yeah, yeah. So uh, in my Web2 background, there were definitely a lot of conversations we had like this, but a lot of the most of the guys around me were purely allergic to many of the phrases, privileges, safe spaces. And it's been really fun to sort of rediscover this lens, mostly through you, Gloria. Um, but I'm still wondering how to approach this type of conversation with all the people who have decided not to be here on the road. Mm. All right, you want to move the, let's move yourself to a table and then people can come to you. Anybody else want to pitch an idea of a DNI thing that they want to work on here? Yeah. Okay, codes and conducts and procedures in DAOs. You want to take that table right there? All right. Anyone else have an idea they want to explore? Because I'll throw some out. All right. All right. Let's say if you want to take the privilege test, I'm going to put it back in the back corner right there. I'll tell you how to get onto that site. Uh, if you want to explore safety at DEF CON, uh, I'm going to keep Loey here and you can hang out with Loey. Uh, I trust you to explore that. That would be good. Um, if you would like to make a list uh, or a Twitter list of people we should follow of different types of DNI background, let's try. Do you mind being Latin M in the back? All right. Let's see. Can we get a black at one that will give us a black at list? Cash, you want to take that one? All right. Cool. Cash, we'll keep that there. Uh, women, do you want to do a women list, Maggie? Can I keep you in charge of the women to follow list? Awesome. Neurodivergent or LGBT, do we want any of those lists? Can we, anybody want to do an organizational list? Okay, organizational list. 
Awesome. Okay, cool. Uh, I will let you all spread to wherever you want to spread. I'll give you this moment, and then uh, we'll also get started on, on any of the lists that you want to go.